what we're also saying is that, you know, get those feedbacks loop in. And API Design First helps with that too. But of course, people using your API, whether it's internally or small beta testing, that gets even more feedback than your design will. Because once the, once the tires hit the road, things always change. From Toro Cloud, this is the Coding Over Cocktails podcast, a free pool of thoughts and ideas from IT experts, thought leaders, and authors sharing their insights and advice for individuals architecting solutions for the ever-changing landscape of enterprise tech, digital transformation, and more. Welcome to episode 63 of the Coding Over Cocktails podcast. My name is Kevin Montalbo, and joining us from Sydney, Australia, is Toro Cloud CEO and founder, David Brown. Hey, David. Hi there, Kevin. How are you? I'm great. All right. I'm very excited to say that we have two guests today joining us for a round of cocktails. Our first guest is a senior architect working with the Swagger slash OpenAPI team at SmartBear, who aims to reduce API friction and help teams build better tools. He is joined by our second guest, who is a consultant providing services around APIs such as backend development, technical writing, content production, and API design consulting. Together, they are the co-authors of the upcoming book, Designing APIs with Swagger and Open API, courtesy of Manning Publications. Stick around until the end of the video to learn more about the book and how you can get your hands on a free copy. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Josh Ponalat and Lucas Rosenstock. Hi, guys. Welcome to the show. Hey, Kevin. Hello. Good to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Yeah. So let's first start with Josh. Uh, Josh, the title of the book is Designing APIs with Swagger and Open API. So what is the relationship between Swagger and Open API? Swagger was the beginning. Yeah, that, that was everything. It was the tooling. It was the idea of describing HTTP APIs. And then at some point later on in its life cycle, um, in order to keep it open, the heart of Swagger, the specification, the standard got donated to the Linux Foundation. And that got, as part of that transition, that got renamed OpenAPI. So this is why we have these, these two buzzwords in today. Um, they are still separate entities, but they started out as one. And so we often see them used synonymously with each other. And so when you refer to Swagger in the title, are you talking about the specification? Or are you talking about tooling? Uh, yeah. Or is it, just, um, is it just because some people get confused between Swagger and OpenAPI? Because I often hear a lot of people referring to OpenAPI as Swagger when they're referring to the specification. Exactly. So, but, I mean, that's kind of why we went with the title. We wanted a catch-all. We wanted, you know, yeah. we wanted to show that both were here. Um, but to be more technical, yes, we're referring to a certain set of tools um, that fall under the Swagger umbrella. So when we're designing APIs, we use those tools within the book to, to design open API or to describe them. Yeah, right. Lucas, uh, as I understand it, you joined uh, Josh a little bit later as a co-author on this book. Uh, tell us a bit about your background and what led you to uh, co-authoring the book with Josh. So, so I I was working as um, as Kevin said in the introduction. I was working as a freelancer doing work around APIs, and it was kind of funny because I had just um, um, started a new website for for myself, and it was one of the first messages that came in through the contact form was a message from uh, Manning, the publisher, and they said, oh, they, they are um, currently on the search for co-authors for a book. And um, yeah, I, so, so I was asked um, to join it and I thought about it a bit because obviously a book is a big project, but because I was already doing writing, writing work before, but I had never um, written a book. So I, I thought, yeah, this is, this is a great, great experience. So I would like to join the book. And yeah, it was it was a good experience uh, writing this book together with Josh. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad Lucas joined in there. Yeah, yeah, because it's a huge undertaking. How did you guys go about breaking up the uh, content and chapters between you? So at this point, I'd have written about a third of the book, and I was burning out. This book yeah. writing is, my goodness, it's <laughs> never write a book. <laughs> Lessons learned. Um, and then so thereafter, the, the structure of the book, we, we sort of sat down, we looked at, you know, how can we break this down to something that we use in software development? How we break this down to sprints? 
mm-hmm. or certain milestones. And so we divided the last two sections of the books in three parts um, based on that. And we had this, this cool little like rhythm of each section would be a sprint. And, and so based on that, we, we mixed and matched a few chapters and, um, and some of the brainstorming sessions around like the dummy projects and, and all that sort of stuff. I um, I found it really interesting to um, to work on this the structure of the book and to be honest we kind of restructured it even a few times in the process because um, the also like the biggest challenge at the beginning was to find a coherent narrative and to decide together okay what do we want to tell in the book and um, how do we um, create a structure that we both know what we want to say and that we um, both can write parts of the book. That, that we can work on individually, but the parts still fit together um, at the end and uh, and create this, this yeah, you could k- tell it like a story which you want to tell. The story about APIs. Well, let's get started on that story. So it's obviously about open API, the specification and the tooling associated with that. Uh, many of our listeners will have actually heard about open API and Swagger many, several times before, but let's start at the beginning. What is open API? What are the advantages of using an API description format? such as open API. So I like to think of it, I, I have this recipe analogy when it, when it comes to open API. So if you have a restaurant, um, we can view that as the service, right? You're, you're, you, you have this food you want to get out the door. And then in order to get that food out the door, if, if you're the customer, you look at a menu and say, oh, I'd like the burger with some fries. Mm. So what open API does is it makes those menus something you can hold in your hand and something that you can focus on without actually having to think about the restaurant or, um, or some bespoke format. It's a standard way of writing menus for services, i.e. APIs. Now, this is a, a difficult question to answer objectively because <laughs> given that you, you work for Swagger, but uh, <laughs> Open API or Swagger, the the, the uh, original version of uh, Open API, wasn't the only game in town when it came to uh, the API description formats, right? There was a bunch of a sure. bunch of others. So, what makes Open API the specification of choice? What's why has it evolved to be the standard for describing RESTful APIs? So, Swagger, I mean. Okay, open API. Today, it's, it's simply because it's the agreed upon standard, right? For better or worse. And, and that's what makes it the choice today. What led to it becoming the standard for description formats? I would think it, it was its focus on, on tooling as opposed to completeness and power. A lot of the other HTTP API definition formats are actually easier to use. Um, They're more powerful when it comes to uh, composition of your documents, but because of that power, tooling wasn't able to keep up. Mm -hmm. And OpenAPI managed to restrict the space heavily, and in some cases controversially, like with JSON schema being a, a flavor or a subset of it, but it allowed tooling to be able to do useful things with it. So I believe that was one of its features leading up to it, but as if we were to compare it today, like if RAML or API Blueprint or any of these other formats were the standard, that would be it, no question. It's really the one that everyone's using. That's the one I want to use. Whether it's good or bad is a little more subjective. It's interesting because some of those other formats were also driven by commercial enterprises, which were pushing the format for their own platforms as well. So um, mm-hmm. I wonder if that also played a part in that uh, Swagger was being a little bit more the Switzerland whilst providing yeah, good tooling to facilitate whether it's deployed on uh, right. this IPAS or that IPAS, you know, whatever the, the platform of choice was. Um, early on in the book, there's a section that goes on to discuss open API and when not to use it. Um, so it's interesting that you describe that, that it's not necessarily uh the, the a description format which can be, should be used in all use cases. Can you tell us a little bit about that? When and what, when not to use Open API? I think um, there um, are different kinds of APIs uh, that that we need to look at. So there's um, um, 
th that what what we usually call REST APIs, um, even though that 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 term could also be controversial because not everything that uh, we call REST is actually REST by the definition. Like APIs which that's have different program. endpoints <laughs> with different. <laughs> that's a, that's another program. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Why we call REST is not really RESTful. <laughs> yeah. So um, so we have these kinds of APIs that have different endpoints with uh, different uh, requests and responses. And if you have this kind of API, then um, open API is perfect. But then there are other um, types of APIs. There are APIs which are based on query languages like uh, GraphQL, and there are APIs um, uh, based on RPC, so remote procedure calls. So there are different ways to design APIs. And really, if you have uh, any of these other formats, then open API is probably not the best format to um, describe that API. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's it, right? It's when HTTP is used as a transport rather than the API itself. Um, it, it backs a lot of these other technologies. And sometimes when, to expand on even further, things like hypermedia, when the semantics are richer than what HTTP may offer, um, open API doesn't, there's better ways of describing that. Hopefully, um, I'm not too versed in that, but open API isn't too great when it comes to hypermedia. Interesting. Um, we've covered a, a lot of the benefits here of taking an API first design approach. Uh, we've talked about it extensively on this podcast, but you mentioned in the book that whilst taking an API first approach for API design, it does come, is, is, a, is a good approach and is valuable. It does come with trade-offs. Can, can you run us through the trade-offs you're referring to? Okay. So the trade-offs are, it's, it's a process. And unless you get a lot of buying into that process, uh, you, you risk having your, your team members get frustrated or aggravated with this idea that, you know, we need to think about the API ahead of time. And I think that a half-baked process might be worse than no process at all, thinking pragmatically here. Um, and then in those cases where either your scope is to, uh, your teams are too large to adopt this full scale, you know, you want to think in small steps to get to an API design first. And that may start with simply documenting the world around you, simply taking your services and, and doing a code first approach, which is very incremental, right? You can add little sprinkle little annotations along your Java code, and you'll be able to generate these open API definitions, which could lead to being a gateway drug into, ooh, I kind of like the benefits I'm getting out of it. But slamming on design first as you know, without thinking about these process changes and getting the buy and showing the problems it's solving, I think that could lead to more hurt than, um, than benefit. And it's something I think we should go in with open eyes. Lucas, you're nodding your head there. So you're <laughs> well in agreement here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, with all this said, API design first, you know, that's where we want to be, right? That's the destination. Yeah. That's definitely a good thing. But depending on the maturity and where you are with your teams, that might not be the first thing you tackle. You could think of API design first as the as the North Star, as your as your goal. And um, even if you don't fully um, um, can implement that that process in your in your organization, it still helps to set that as the goal and then move incrementally, as Josh said. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, we often talk about these things like you should you know, go headlong into it as because it's best practice, but maybe it should be, like you say, that North Star instead in, in a lot of use cases and, and prove, get proof of concept, but yeah, perhaps first. Um, okay, so um, what you mentioned, um, Josh, JSON schema briefly before, and I think there's some confusion between uh, the role of JSON schema and open API. In fact, Postman, we had uh, uh, Postman on the program not that long ago. And in their survey, they um, asked their uh, participants to choose the way they describe APIs. And, and JSON schema was up against open API as a way of describing uh, APIs. But um, some people may not realize JSON schema is still used within OpenAPI, and I think that distinction is, is, is pretty unclear. Can you run us through how that works? So JSON schema, it describes data for those who, I, I'm assuming a lot of the folks on this channel may have heard of it in some form or fashion, and it predates OpenAPI. Um, where I like to find the distinction is that 
we're mostly interested in data. And when it comes to describing the services, that tends to be all our focus is, I just want to know the shape of this data coming in and going out, being returned to me, what I need to push up. And so we can think of it that way. In fact, we could get far just by describing those things as JSON schema. However, where Open API comes in, it's connecting these JSON schema schemas together for HTTP requests and responses. So we're saying, well, okay, when this message, which I've called foobar, right, I need to send it against this endpoint with this method and maybe these query parameters. Now, yes, you could just have JSON schema and you have to somehow out of context describe which API endpoints it comes to based on whatever you got going, or you can combine the two together. And again, Open API encapsulates to wrap around JSON schema. JSON scheme is really the tasty part, right? And Open API connects these dots together to give us um, to give us a cohesive API. Tasty API schema. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> the um, uh, JSON schema, the Open API supports a subset of JSON right. schema, right? So, so what does that mean? What is what is the subset? So it did support a subset. So we're, we've got three major versions of Open API today. One, which we might call Swagger 2.0 and get slapped around a bit, which we can rename to Open API 2.0. Then we got 3.0, and we're currently on 3.1. Yeah. So 2.0 and 3.0, they're the ones that have this subset of JSON schema. So they've limited certain features of, of JSON schema. Again, as previously mentioned, I think it was to make tooling better and easier to maintain and build. Um, but that was controversial because just like we'd want to reuse those schemas in different tooling um, on independently, those JSON schemas, you know, there's a whole tooling ecosystem around that. So why can't we just shuffle them in and out? So when it came to 3.1, the, the specification team decided, okay, we're going to add full-on support for JSON schema. So there's no subset of it. Now they have added a few bits on top to make it easier to describe XML shapes um, the little discriminator flag and one or two bits and bobs on top of JSON schema, but that's on top, right? So they support everything in JSON schema 2020-12, which is JSON schema's weird draft versioning system that's always confusing the hell out of me. So yeah, 3.0, there's a subset and you have to maybe get a little converter just to tweak it a bit. It's not major, it's things like type might be Boolean, and in JSON schema, you can have multiple types. So you can have booling or null, which was the big one there. Um, but 3.0 is going to have, uh, sorry, 3.1 does have full JSON schema support. Um, but because of that, tooling is really struggling to catch up and we're not seeing as much adoption of it as, we, as we'd like to see. But that'll definitely change. Hmm. The uh, more technical question now. Uh, I was reading some of the excerpts from your from your book, and I found the section on inheritance and polymorphism in domain models quite interesting. Can you run us through uh, how they apply to Open API? Yeah, sure. So um, I would um, um, I, I would I would like to introduce the the example that we use in the book because I think that makes it um, easier to understand. So in the Second and third part of our book, we um, present an application called um, PetSitter, and the idea is it's it's a marketplace. It's basically like an Airbnb or Uber for uh, pet sitting. And um, in their first version, they um, just make it um, an application to um, take dogs for a walk. But then later, they want to expand it to um, to more pets, and um, that's where this um, inheritance and polymorphism comes in because. Um, in the domain model, they have jobs and they have um, they have users and and they have dogs. And later, the the question is: Okay, should we should we add like a different um, date uh, model to our domain model? Um, um, just add a new concept, and obviously, like any concept in a domain model, turns into a JSON schema later. So, will we have like a schema for dog? Will we have a schema for cat? Will we have a schema for like whatever else? you have there. And then if you do that, you kind of lose that information. Okay. Like a dog is a pet, a cat is a pet. And uh, we may want to express, okay, a job, a job has a pet and that pet that can either be a dog or a cat. So we have these um, kind of like advanced scenarios in a domain model where we want to, we want to show, okay, this, this, 
this concept is a subtype of another and um, like who, whoever has done uh, object oriented programming knows about um, um, class inheritance and we have similar concepts in JSON schema and um, so we have uh, composition keywords where we can um, create a schema and we can say, and say okay this schema actually inherits from inherits fields from another schema or is a composition of different schemas and um, right yeah that's that's the gist of it and the polymorphism um, the the idea of polymorphism is that you can that you can always like replace a, a subtype with a um, uh, with with its super type so that means um, in the example that I mentioned that wherever we have dog and um, cat or we can we can have all these other pets but we know okay we have the super type pet so so whenever we um we use a dog or a cat we know that this is this is a pet and we can use the use the uh, the um pet the the super type for it i mean it's i really, think what yeah, sorry go sorry josh go on uh, i think what it comes down to at least for me um i there's a lot of these modeling processes that are fantastic but it's coming just i want to write a model once somewhere and be able to reuse it as much as possible with tweaks in and out. JSON schema still struggles a lot with that. We're not near what RAML and, and tools like that can do, um, but it does have them, right? And, and learning how to use them keeps our things more consistent. Mm -hmm. How uh, should developers manage breaking change in an API? I know you cover this in your book. Uh, so. Clearly, we have versioning and, and that sort of stuff. But I, in, in practice, I see a lot of bad practices <laughs> emerging. We're consuming a lot of APIs as an integration platform, as a service ourselves. So, right. so really, how develop, how sh what practices should developers follow to manage? Never, break? never break your API. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's sort of it summed up in one, in one phrase. So, I mean, we can ask the question, how do we never break our API? But before we do, we can we can change this never break your eye into weigh the cost of what it's going to cost to break your consumers. What's the cost involved with that, which is different, right? So public APIs, open ended. We have no idea. You know, mission critical systems could be built on this. Internally, we may have a better idea. So we could think, all right, you know, Bob just over there, he's the only one and he uses this for like a little reporting thing. Ah, minimal cost yeah. versus the cost of working around it because we're actually not breaking it. These aren't breaking changes, we're mitigating so that we don't break them. So when we add versioning or anything like this, we're not breaking our API, we're adding something. And then it becomes a question of how do we reduce the cost of working around this potentially breaking change? I like to think of them more as like mutable changes. We're changing something that you're using to make it in a, diff you know, a different way of using that same thing, which is different from say, adding a completely independent feature. But yeah, they're, they're not breaking changes in, in my mind, right? We're mitigating them. And then to maybe to answer your question, which is like, okay, now that Josh has gone through all this hoopla of like, he doesn't like breaking changes. So what do we do? Well, we keep things open-ended. That's, that's most helpful, right? A little trick is never have a, ra a raise as your top level item, have an object. Um, this is predominantly for JSON, obviously, as, as your messaging format so that you can keep adding fields to it. Um, that's one way of keeping something open-ended where if you had a field called items and it's a bad list of things and you don't want that to be the list anymore, you can change that to maybe another field with items too. Yeah, not the greatest example, but at least it's additive and you can then supersede one with the other. So you can say, well, if items two exists, ignore items. That means my consumers have, you know, are targeting the right source and we can and we can override it, but while still keeping those other consumers happy and um, and ticking over. Um, I would like to add that um, going through an API design first approach really really helps uh, preventing breaking changes because, like when you when you go code first uh, and you just start writing something, it's very easy to write something that's. Uh, um, that's not backwards compatible if you need to change things later. But with API design first, because you have an actual design phase where you, um, where you think about designing your API, you're trying to make it consistent. And you're, that's like the chance you have to really think forward. Okay, how can we do um, things like what just said, like design our schemas in a way that we can easily extend them without breaking stuff. 
So um, we should really use, um, as API designers, we should really use that design phase to think ahead and see, okay, how can we build an API that we can maintain for a long time and change without breaking it? And in terms of versioning your API, going from major version one to version two, it's okay to introduce breaking changes? So versioning is the last resort. That's like you've tried everything under the sun and you've just given up. This API is awful. It was built in the Stone Age. What you're doing, and I like to think of it, Rich Hickey, idol of mine, right? Uh, Closure. And, And his Simple Made Easy, one of his great talks, he talks about this idea of versioning. And it's really just a new thing. So version one is foo and version two is bar. Now, we may still want to hold on to the assets like the name of the domain and and other various things to call it version two, but effectively, it's a new API. So anything goes, right? You're designing an API from scratch. Um, You're not trying to worry about previous consumers with it. So yeah, you can break everything, do what you need to, but it is a last resort. That is, that's the, the atom bomb of like, okay, no, we're done now. New API entirely. And what should be a trans, if that is the atom bomb approach that someone is taking, what should be the transition strategy? I, I heard that some vendors, the Salesforce is the one that came to mind, still supporting some 30 versions of their API. Uh, so what is, what is a you know, migration strategy? When do you turn off the old API and how do you, how do, you do that process? That's true. I mean, poor Salesforce, 30, wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's rough. So when we comes back down to that equation at the beginning. What is the cost to your consumers? And if you can figure out, if you can start to quantify that cost of removing an API, which is effectively breaking them, or breaking parts of it in order to merge it with another one, whatever that may be. And that, that comes from metrics, that comes from having a dialogue with your consumers. That's where the energy should be right? Figuring out that cost. Because once you've got that quantified, now becomes a decision you can make. Uh, transitioning is is blind until you have that to say, well, yeah, we'll shut it off or we will shut off parts of it. It, it ends up being the same thing. You're blindly do, taking action, um, but whereas you should be focusing in on like, how can we make this a quantifiable decision to, to move over these consumers or to completely remove the API, whether it's a version or an entire API? And you need to be really transparent with your um, API consumers. You need to clearly communicate what your roadmap is. Um, and you need to plan ahead, like how many versions you can support, because the worst thing they could probably do as an API provider is give users the, um, um, the impression that you will support this thing forever and then give them a shutdown notice of 30 days or something. So right. it's, it's really about um, communicating with, uh, with the customer and, and setting clear expectations on, on how and when you will uh, deprecate the API and then give, give them some time to, to move off to a new version. Yeah. The final chapter of your book is titled The API Pre-Release Checklist. Uh, Can you share with us some of the essential characteristics that an API should have before it is released? Yeah, I I think this this comes as a great segue because it's it's monitoring, it's metrics, it's security. Mm -hmm. I think one of the whole or a mistake people may make is releasing too much of their API and getting stuck into that. If this is the first time your API is going public, you're in a position to release as small as necessary. And so that you can focus on making that as robust as possible um, with your metrics, get, figuring out how much stuff is going in and out there, um, adding your identifiers if you can, you know, try to figure out where your traffic's coming from. Security is becoming more and more important today. And after the fact, security is more expensive than before the fact. So if you can, double down on that if you have the resources. Um, but yeah, re- release small amounts of your API. Uh, I think that's that's the key here. And then you can focus in on how you're going to grow that without having major impacts to the rest of your API. Um, of course, testing and and being robust all come from this part, you're right? So the checklist is there to to think about these things and decide how much to invest in making them more robust. But yeah, if your API is small, then you have less to worry about across the board. Yeah, Josh, Josh previously talked about the cost of, of changes and the cost of breaking changes and why I want to avoid them. And the, I mean, the, obvi- the math is obvious that the more consumers your API has, the, 
more difficult it is to change it um, because the cost is higher because there are more consumers relying on a certain behavior. You can change things more easily if you just use it internally and if it's just like two people. And then you, if you expand it to, let's say, limited group of like a few external consumers, they, it's still pretty reasonable to make changes. But once you've opened up uh, the floodgates and, and, and people use that, it's it's really hard. And then you need to think about all these this maintenance um questions and you need to get your um, your roadmap you need to get your developer experience right and it's also about um, things like like documentation and providing support because um, yeah you can probably like if it's just one API consumer and one API provider they, they can talk to each other but that obviously doesn't scale so um, at some point you need to make sure that the documentation you have for your API is really good um, so that people can figure out their problems um, and and solve them. We have one chapter where we talk about error handling and how important it is that APIs return error messages that um, API consumers can actually make sense of and 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 debug their integrations without having to um, ask a support person, which again doesn't doesn't scale. So it's it's really about getting all these small things um, right that that help people um, work with the API and. Again, the more people use it, the more expensive it becomes to change, the more investing in developer experience pays off in the end. So, um, so it's really important to get to a certain level of um, these things before you can uh, release an API to the public. And, and we want those problems, right? So we want tons and tons and tons of people using the API. Uh, what, what we're also saying is that, you know, get those feedbacks loop in. And API Design First helps with that too. But of course, people using your API, whether it's internally or small beta testing, that gets even more feedback than your design will, because once the once the tires hit the road, things always change. So much good advice, not only on open API but API design as well. Best practices. Uh, when can we expect the final published version of the book? So the book itself is written, and it's going through the stages of um, we've already done the proofing stage. It's going through the indexing, and then the layout stages. Yep. So I think we're on the order of a month or two, but I don't actually know. And we can get back to you on that for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I did read it was targeting around April. So that, that uh, sounds what your publisher is sort of <laughs> promoting. <at least> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need to check. Yeah. You've got better info than we do. Um, where can our listeners uh, follow you and keep up to date with uh, the publication of this book? So I think Manning is probably the best port of call for the book um, with the title, obviously designing APIs at Swagger and open API. There's the meet program. Um, we are building the website designingapis.com as a, a sort of housing platform for the book. Um, it's still in its early stages, but we'll be growing that out as well. Okay. And of course you can, uh, you can follow us. Um, for example, I'm 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 pretty active on Twitter, and I post um, updates um, regularly, um, both about the book, but also I generally share a few stories about um, APIs, interesting stuff that I read. So um, yeah, I would like I would like to keep in touch over Twitter. And your and your yeah. handle, Lucas? Your handle is just my my name, Lucas Rosenstock. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, so if you like maps and weird stuff, Jay Ponalat. <laughs> Otherwise, just follow the Swagger API Twitter handler, where it's more. API focused. Josh and Lucas, thank you so much for your time today. Thank yeah. you, David. Thanks. Yeah, this thanks for having us. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, listeners, hope you had a wonderful time with that conversation. For those who stuck around, we've got a very special surprise for you. We're giving away a copy of Josh and Lucas' book, Designing APIs with Swagger and Open API, courtesy of Manning Publications. Simply follow us on Twitter at Toro Cloud, like, and retweet our contest post. Again, thanks for joining us in this podcast. Please like, subscribe, and check out our website at torocloud.com for a transcript of this episode and show notes. On behalf of the team here at Toro Cloud, thank you very much for joining us today. This has been Kevin Montalbo for Coding Over Cocktails. Cheers! <laughs>